Hey guys, what's up? It's Evan Ross Katz. I'm senior style editor here at Mike.com. It's the holiday season. I love a gift, and I'm joined by a fantastic gift for all of our holiday needs. Jake Shears, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. So to start with, you have a lot coming up in 2018, which we will get to. Book, musical, music, etc. I want to start with the music, though. Yeah. You're going the solo route. You just released the first single. Yeah. Can you talk to us about sort of what we can expect of your new music? And correct me if I'm wrong, this is some of the first new music from you in about five years. Yeah, exactly. So what's it like being back in the studio, recording new music? It's been so much fun. I've, I, I really wanted to, uh, for years I was, I was writing and, and really wanted to make a record, but wasn't quite sure what it was going to be. And um, it was a very special recording process. It's taken me about two years to make the whole thing. And I recorded it in a very different way from everything else I've ever done. So it was really challenging and exciting. And uh, I, I went to Kentucky and Louisville and did it. I did some of it in New Orleans. And um, yeah, it was just a magical time. And, uh, you know, I, I got to make something that I'm, you know, super proud of. So this is the first single in what's going to be an entire album? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it was, it's not really an official single. I just, I wanted to put something out just to fans. And, and you know, I just played a couple shows. I played a show in New York and London. And I wanted to, I wanted to put something out just so people coming to the shows would kind of, ha you know, have a new song that they could like, yeah, yeah. you know, get into. So this is the first uh, music that, like I said, you're doing solo. Prior to that, you were the front man from the Scissor Sisters. But I want to back up a little bit to you arriving in New York City. Um, when did you first come to New York City and, what was sort of nightlife and the city and the vibe like of the of the New York that you came into? I came into New York in 1999, and uh, first was living out in Crown Heights for a for a second, and then moved into uh, moved over to Williamsburg. Um, it was very different. It was a lot of fun. It was restrained in certain ways because of the cabaret law and. Places were really strict on on no dancing, so you know there'd be huge signs in in venues or bars or wherever you went, you know, in big letters that said no dancing. Which when I moved to New York, I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever seen, and so it was funny trying to figure out you know ways to get around that or where to go. Or um, but there was a lot going on, and there was great people, and I, I did most of my hanging out either in. Uh, the East Village or uh, over in Williamsburg when Lux opened over there. And, you know, the Roxy was going on, which was, uh, you know, I kind of hated it, but I also sort of loved it <laughs> all the time. Um, you know, I, at the Roxy, I would kind of complain about the music. It would always be like, you know, Junior Vasquez for a while, I think we'd play sometimes. And then, and then you know, Peter Rohoffer became like the resident DJ. and. And I really like, I couldn't stand that music. I thought it was terrible, it's all trash. And then now I think back so fondly of that music and I really love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it was, it was a magical time, it was really sweet. I lived kind of wherever I could. I'd, you know, live in really weird spaces. And, um, you know, I started dancing, I started go-go dancing and, and just had a lot of fun. I was in college. But uh, I, you know, was wrapping up a couple years of school at Eugene Lang. But it was kind of just my excuse to be here. You know, I did well, yeah. I got work done. But it was just sort of my, you know, I, I wanted to be here. And so when you first came up here, was the goal to be in a band, to be famous? Like, where were your aspirations upon first arrival? I didn't quite know. I was writing fiction. Um, I knew there was something in me that wanted to perform. And, uh, and that's about all I knew. I just had faith that I would figure, I'd figure it out. And go-go dancing was kind of a, a way for me to at least get like a, the amount, uh, you know, an amount of attention that I needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I've always needed attention, like since I was a little kid. So um, it was a way to try to figure out a, a positive way to like get that satisfaction of, of you know, of what I, you know, what my soul needed. So, um, so that was just like a, an easy thing to, to, you know, to start 
performing in that way. And yeah, I just had faith that something would happen, that I'd figure something out. I mean, right. I was doing like improv stuff with some NYU kids and having a blast doing that. I would kind of just like tumble into whatever I would could find, you know? Now, I know that you came out at 15 years old, famously upon uh, the advice of Dan Savage, mm. and then you came here, ostensibly you were out of the closet. What was it like sort of moving to a city like this, being openly gay in a city like New York at a time like that? I felt a, uh, a freedom that I had been looking for, you know, since I'd come out when I was 15, because I, I'd been in some you know, some strange spots and like I really, there was, there was something that I was, there was a kind of freedom that I'd been looking for that I really feel like I, I found here. Um, and it took a little while to get there, but I think it was, it was around the time of like the blackout here that I remember feeling really like that I'd gotten to a place that I'd been striving for just as far as just being myself and doing what I wanted to be doing and um, you know meeting guys all the time and just like having fun and making new friends um, yeah that's what it felt like it felt like I'd, I'd, I'd gotten to a spot that I'd been like been looking for because I went to LA for a year like when I was 17 17 18 um, my freshman year of college and I just it was fine but I didn't I didn't love it and I'd never really been to New York, but I knew that if I wasn't, I wanted to be in a big city, but I knew if I didn't want to be in, if I didn't, if I wasn't into LA, that I would, you know, that I would be better off in New York. Even, I, even though I didn't really know what New York was going to be like, I just had a feeling. Right. So I want to talk about those early days with the Scissor Sisters, be sort of before you guys were an established group, when you were first doing those concerts together. How were you guys introduced, and what were those concerts like? Before you had a catalog that people knew, and before people knew you as a collective, what were those early performances? The, the early performances were really silly, and we were just having fun. I mean, it's, when it was just, you know, first of all, the first couple shows were just me and Scott, Baby Daddy. And then when Anna joined, the three of us, we played for a while, just the three of us. And it was just, you know, it was just really dumb and fun. And the songs were silly and, and we were just having a good time. Anna was so funny. And, you know, we'd write like a new song every week. And then, you know, every show we kind of sort of had something new to play and try stuff out. It either worked or it didn't. Um, we'd play like, sit, we'd, we'd play in B-Bar or... Marion's, you know, while people are like eating their dinner. <laughs> or, you know, we'd, you know, Baby Daddy and I would get like on the bar at the cock, uh, you know, at one in the morning. Just, <laughs> yeah. you know, we would just get up there and, and sing. And it was, it was, it was very impromptu. It was, uh, but we did take it kind of serious. We just, we were having fun, but we were, we were enjoying writing music and, um, and I love that places would just let us get up and 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 play. It's not like we we're making any any money or anything, but uh, but yeah, they were just they were fun. They were just tiny little shows that were a lot of fun. Was there like a particular moment or incident or something that happened that made you say, "Okay, the Scissor Sisters is going to be a thing that I can pursue as a career path. This is more than just fun at the bar on the cock. That this is actually something that I can garner a fan base for." Um, there was a, a little a record, an indie label that wanted to put out um, a couple songs of ours with Cuff, Comfortably Numb as the B-side on, on the vinyl. And once, that, once I had a record in my hands, um, and once I heard a, one of our songs played at a huge party by one of my favorite DJs, I... Uh, that's when I, that's when I knew that this was totally like viable and that we could actually do this and um, that this was going. I just knew I was like, this is going to be my life. Like this is what I want to do. And what was it like in the beginning, sort of cultivating fans and having people start to recognize you and the music? Was what was that experience like? Well, first it was just getting our friends to the shows. You know, I would um, just you know at, when we started playing Lux. You know, we'd get 50 people there, and um, and then it just it just started getting bigger and bigger, and 
yeah, I don't know. Um, was there a moment you said, we've made it, or I'm famous, or did that happen over time? I, I think it happened over, I think it happened over time. And can you um, break down for me, like, the you guys are particularly really big in the UK. We were, yeah. And you are, you still are. Uh, no, but can you break down for me what it was you think that attracted that fan base so immediately? When we got signed over there, um, Polydor you, you signed us. Uh, and that's where we ended up going. I mean, they, they put us up in a, in a flat in Marlebone. The band was living together. It was like old school. It was like the end of a era. They really don't do stuff like this anymore, record labels and, and whatnot. So they had us stationed over there. And we toured the UK in a van. We played everywhere three times. We just kept running around and around and around the UK, just like hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And when the first album came out, it came out first over there. And, you know, it, it did okay. Our first single charted at 56. The album came in at 11 and dropped immediately. And we just kept, you know, it, we just kept working at it. And it was amazing that the that Polydor really believed in it and, you know, stayed behind us until it, until it finally broke. At that point, how important was it for you that your queerness be an overt part of the Scissor Sisters? Or was that even a thought at all? It wasn't even really a thought. It's not something I, I was necessarily conscious about. Um, because when we started making music, I was just wanting to be kind of, you know, myself and just sort of do what I felt. And it was written into the music. So there was no, there was no way to kind of, there was no, you know, way to even pull that out of it. It was just in there, and especially with Anna, like, you know, being who she is, and it was just inherently in the fabric of, of what we were doing. Did you ever feel like the record label, or there were ever any forces trying to sort of like make the music more heteronormative in any way? Was that ever a problem that you came up against? No one was trying to make the music, no one was trying to change the music. The, the, what, what happened though, and I think in certain cases in the States, um, we were on Republic over here first on Universal, and I, th I think uh, definitely, I think the men upstairs, um, I think were pretty dismissive of us and didn't really want to get their hands on it. It still felt like it was very much like a, a boys club, you know? So I think that uh, we probably took some, it made it harder for us in certain ways, just because, just internally. Um, Polydor was never like that, but I think that in other spots around the world, and especially the US, I think, I think that kind of our queerness sort of made it a little more difficult for us. Were there LGBTQ artists or groups growing up that you sort of looked at um, and sort of aspired to be them or sort of, you know, just enjoyed? I mean, I discovered Bowie when I was eight and he's always been my, my number one. And, uh, you know, he's walked all sorts of lines and uh, it was just one of my, one of my biggest inspirations. Uh, just since being since being a little kid, and I still, you know, I still listen to him incessantly. And um, I remember when I was about six, uh, "Relax" by Frankie Goes to Hollywood became you know a, a worldwide phenomenon, and um, I loved that song so much. And I knew that something was like really sort of wrong with it, and. Uh, I knew there was something sort of lascivious about Holly Johnson, and, and just it, I knew that it was it was dirty, and uh, like in a good way. I knew it was like really naughty, and um, I loved that song. And I remember my sister walking through the house. My parents were very happy about it. But I remember she had a T-shirt that just said "Up Yours, Frankie" in like <laughs> like big black letters, and uh, I don't know. I just thought that was like super cool. You know, yeah. and that also there, that my sister was wearing this kind of like anti-gay, like Frankie shirt. I just knew it was like cool what they were doing um, and different. So as far as like an early memory, that would that that would be like yeah. 
Yeah. You mentioned that attraction to lasciviousness, and there's something just really like sexual about the Scissor Sisters and your identity in pop culture, and just there's like a, a sweatiness and an excitement and an eroticism about the music and the image around that. How much of that is like cultivated, and how much of that is just you guys are being you, and that's how it gets reflected? I think that's just us being us, and that's, I don't, you know. I don't know if all of our music is sexy. I think also, I think, I think having a sense of humor is sexy, and I think that's really a big part of it. Is the sort of the humor in the music. I think in a certain yeah. way, it um, it's not so serious, and I think that can be sexy. Okay, so speaking of not so serious, in 2012. I remember very vividly, I was with Eddie Black at a party and he was like, I have this new track from the Scissor Sisters, let's have a kiki. We were about to go out, he's like, let me put it on, I will never forget this. And he put it on and I just remember all of us were like, we knew something special was there. Can you, I've always wanted to ask this and I'm so excited to have this conversation. Can you talk about the genesis of let's have a kiki? Yeah. Um... We were making Magic Hour and we had a bunch of songs and I really, uh, you know, I, I wanted Anna to, you know, have, a, always I want her to have special songs. And um, we, we started, you know, and, and when, I, when I'm writing with Anna, it's like I really want to tap into you know, her head and, and the things that she's into. And she always loved this song that was a, it was like a, <laughs> it was a sample of Margaret Thatcher talking over this acid beat. And it, it's, they cut Margaret Thatcher's voice up to be saying, uh, let's have an acid party. And it's the most ridiculous, it's the stupidest song, it's so funny. And so I was, I wanted to kind of, you know, that was definitely a huge inspiration for it. And so, yeah, first we just, uh, we had all these sort of, you know, we put all of those phrases into a, a keyboard. So every key that was pressed said one of those things. And we basically played it until it, you know, sounded, sounded right. And, uh, yeah, we just kept, we, you know, we had a whole, that, that whole monologue at the top is, you know. Iconic. Is, <laughs> and, and it's just like off the top of Anna's head. You know, I remember we had it so uh, she called us in the studio on a cell phone in the next room and we were just like had the phone up to, up to the mic. And yeah, it's just so funny too that every little thing in that monologue kind of became a, <laughs> it became a thing. Oh, for sure. And it was just really, it was, um, we, we just loved that song. And it was, it never, we never really intended it to be anything. Like, we really didn't. It was just, like, on the album, and it was a song we really liked. We let our old manager listen to all the, you know, he kind of would consult us on new music we were making. And he said, came back to us, and he said, this is the worst song you guys have ever written. And <laughs> it's like he hated it and we were like what um so it just goes to show you can't you can't you can't listen to everybody all the time and how many times in interviews were you asked to define a kiki as a result of the song a lot yeah and was it difficult sort of like having to take something that's just so much an experience and have to sort of like commodify it yeah i don't know about commodifying it but it's a pretty simple you know it's yeah. a pretty simple definition it's just like having a laugh with your friends totally um, I want to talk about Glee, because Glee did a famous cover, yeah. Sarah Jessica Parker, they mashed it up with Turkey Lurkey Time. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't seen it, you must, it's on YouTube. Um, how did that work in terms of the reach out, and were you informed that it was going to be the mashup, and what were your thoughts on that? Because I just yeah. love that. <laughs> um, I, I'm friends with Chris Colfer, and uh, I think he was the one who really pushed for it to be in the show. And. Uh, I had a I had a party at my house to watch it when it aired, and it was one of the strangest things I've ever seen, and it made me really happy. Yeah, it's. Um, I thought it was amazing. It's really it's, and seeing Sarah Jessica Parker walk up from the subway on her phone was just one of the weirdest. It was very strange. 
It was it really magical. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. Um, one other specific song I want to ask you about is Shady Love um, from the last album, which was a collaboration with Azalea Banks. Yeah. There's a lot of rumors online about uh, that was supposed to be a single and then it didn't happen. And, uh, and then I read a lot. I wanted to just get your take on the genesis of that song and was it supposed to be a single and if so why was it not etc we were we were friends with her i mean i met her when she was like 17 years old and um yeah we had a great time recording that song and i love that song um and you know as we all know she she didn't turn out to be the easiest she's not the easiest person she's like she can be a little difficult, but that's, you know, that's not a newsflash. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So, uh, there's no, you know, there's no, there was no bad blood or anything. Um, and I don't know, I seriously didn't, you know, expect, she, you know, expect her to, uh, you know, she, she, she got pretty intense, you know, and I, I, I hope she's, I hope she's all right now. I haven't really followed up, but, uh, you know, she really made me mad with some of the stuff that she said, you know. Um, is it difficult then for you to go back and listen to that song, or do you still hold an affection for it? Because, like you said, it is such a great song. I hold an affection for it, and, like, we had a, at the time, like, we had a, we had a great time, and I, you know, I, I really liked her at the time. She was a lot of fun, and she's a great singer and a really great writer, and, um, yeah. So the album came out, and then you guys very famously announced that you were going to go on a hiatus shortly after the album, which has led to a lot of people wondering over the last five years since, if you guys have broken up, if you guys are going to get back together. We had a mini reunion happen in 2016 with Swirlk. Can you sort of talk about, as explicitly as, as you feel comfortable, what happened in 2012 at a, such a moment of popularity to cause you guys to split or go on hiatus? Yeah, uh, we'd been going for, it had been 10 solid years of either we were in the studio making an album or we were on the road. And I didn't want to keep dragging everybody around. It was kind of like no one expected this band to happen like it did. No one expected it to pop off. No one expected it to necessarily be their whole career. Um, I kind of had, you know, knew that it was all possible and, um, you know, I think it's, it's hard when people get sort of in the middle of something like that being like, I never thought that this was going to be my destiny. I kind of just wanted to give everybody their lives back a little bit. It had been, everybody had put in a lot of work, four records, 10 years, Kiki happened and I felt like with Kiki, it was like, I felt like we'd said what we wanted to say. I just didn't know what else, what were we going to do after that. I, I felt like we'd kind of done, we'd sort of done it. So I thought it was a good time to, to, to step out of it, at least for a while. And do you view it as a hiatus, a breakup? I know you get asked this a lot, but like sort of how do you situate the possibility of a future? Uh, I don't even really think about it. Like, it's, it's totally possible someday. I've enjoyed making this new record so much because I don't have to filter any of it through the band, and it doesn't have to pass through, or lyrics that I write, you know, it's like a band, you know, everything you write has to sort of be represented by everyone. And making my own record, I can skip that. And it's, for me, I think it's, it's a little more personal and raw and, um, and I've really enjoyed that. I've enjoyed calling all the shots and um, it's made for, a, it's just been a great process for me. So all I know is I've, you know, I, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing now. And I'd be open down the road, but for now, I'm I'm really wanting to just keep making my music. And the schedule's also like a little busy at the moment. The schedule's <laughs> the schedule's the schedule's busy. Yeah, there's a lot going on. I've just been tucked away for so long, like really prepping for this, like really doing 
doing the work and being patient and knowing that that you know I'm gonna get to present all this you know stuff that I'm really proud of. So let's talk about your recent cover of Attitude Magazine, not your first, um, but in the most recent, you were on the cover of their masculinity issue. Mm. So I want to first ask you, how do you define masculinity? That's such a hard question. Um, I think like non-toxic masculinity <laughs> comes from just, you know, uh, comes from being yourself. I think it can be a costume. I think it cannot be a costume. Um, yeah, I, 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 how would you define masculinity? Oh God, <laughs> it's 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 really tricky. But I would say that like I think one of the interesting things is the conversation around toxic masculinity is one I think we're having more and more as a society, just with sort of the rise of bullying culture on the internet specifically. And I think we're really starting to look at the roots of things like toxic masculinity and fragile masculinity as a result. And there's people like John Legend who are doing like entire campaigns, sort of addressing this from a young age. But so let's go back a minute. So like when you were younger. What were some of your early experiences of, I know like when I was younger, I was putting on the dresses, I was playing with Barbies. What were some of the first um, memories that you have of sort of being an outlier of traditional masculine ideals? Um, I just, I, when, I was, when I was growing up and I was, you know, in, in junior high and high school, I just like, I knew I was different because, you know, I was being singled out at school and getting, you know, bullied pretty hard. Um, so I knew, you know, and then I started, I started provoking that, you know, I started like confronting it, um, you know, sort of head on and, and dressing the part and, uh, getting like weirder and dressing stranger, you know, had I, and I still do, you know, there's like some girliness, you know, in there that, um, and so yeah, I was like, I was, I was a fag, and 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 I sort of knew that, and um, so I, it was like con my first experience was sort of confronting that head on with with act with other people. So would you say? I think one of the things that I love about that story is the idea of taking this thing that people are criticizing you for and saying, I'm going to lean into this even harder, which sounds like was kind of just like instinct for you. But how much of that was like, I'm going to fuck with these people because they don't know shit. And on how much of it was just what you did, that's just what you naturally did. Um, it was, I guess it was kind of both. I just, I, the, you know, and I, in my book, I have this line that's like, you know, at least everybody knew who I was, <laughs> you know, like, I definitely, like, the whole school knew who I was, like, it wasn't popularity, but it was notoriety. Um, and so but, what were some of the physical ways in which you started presenting yourself differently as a result? You said you were leaning into the part, like, when, what ways did that manifest itself? Appearance, um... Appearance, opinions, my mouth. Um, I mean, I was like just, you know, a total goth thrift store mess. Um, you know, really ugly skirts and fishnets on my arms and painted nails and, and uh, you know, long hair and just like, you know, it, I, I wasn't, it wasn't cute. <laughs> when it wasn't pretty. <laughs> when you were called a faggot, were, were, that, were those words that always hurt you or was there any sort of power that you took away from that? I think there was a, there was a power in it. I mean, yeah, it hurt. It was actually, it, it, it hurt me less than it was, it was scary. You know, it was frightening. Um, there was a lot of like scary moments. So it wasn't like a, it didn't really like hurt my feelings that much more than just like it was it was trying to navigate myself around situations where I could actually get physically hurt. So who were I mean you mentioned earlier like Bowie is one of your influences in terms of your presentation in terms of celebrities out there who were some of the men or gender nonconformists that you were seeing in the media that were perhaps influencing the way you were presenting yourself? I mean music wise during that time I was I was really into this band. I was really, really into this band called My Life with a Thrill Kill Cult that I was obsessed with. And they're definitely, if you look at, they're from Chicago, and it was an absolute precursor to Scissor Sisters. Like I, 
definitely took elements of Thrill Kill Cult. It was, uh, it was, it was this queer band. It was diverse. They played disco music. They were devil worshippers. Uh, the lead singer's name was Groovy Man, and he was this total like, you know, creepy queer guy with like long blonde, like not not blonde hair, but long like dark hair, motorcycle jackets, tattoos. He like sang in this real raspy voice. There were these like you know, total, um, you know, these like awesome floozy backup singers and like it was just a total show. burning cauldrons on the side of stage and like it was, it was He awesome. went there, like full yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, it was, and it was a big band, you know, it was like diverse and it was like, yeah, it was queer, like devil worship disco and like that, that, as far as music wise and image wise, like I, Fucking like loved that shit. I'd follow them around a tour. I would get plane tickets to go see them. Like I probably saw them 30 times when I was in high school. Like I absolutely love them. Where are they today? Uh, they still do like little tours. You know the lineups always changed over the years a little bit. And I I feel like I really like was in, you know got to experience them at this sort of. Uh, peak moment, yeah. you know. Cauldrons and all. Um, okay, so Attitude Magazine calls you up. They say, we're doing a masculinity issue. We want you to be the cover star. What was your initial reaction to that request? Um, yeah, I was happy to do it. I, I don't, you know, I'm down to like try anything. I'm like, there's stuff about, there's stuff about it that I talk about in my, in, in my book. You know, all in that early Scissors, scissors I mean, all through, all through Scissors, but I think that when I first started when the band really started going and I was like, you know, really dressing up and, and, um, you know, and there was, there was baby daddy gay in the band, Dell, who's gay in the band. And there was this, there was like this hierarchy of, ma of, of masculinity between the three of us in this way. And I felt like we were always trying to sort of like one up each other. And it made me realize that like, sort of with my looks and stuff, I was trying to prove, prove to myself, I was telling myself that like, uh, I was over all that pain that I went through in high school and whatnot. And I was just like, this is, you know, but I, I think that I was still having issues because when, when you, you know, when you're bullied in high school, you have this desire to kind of like, you wanna be, you wanna be them. You know, you want to be, uh, you know, you see all these all these guys in high school that are, you know, into sports and that are, you know, popular and have girlfriends and um, and you sort of have this desire and you can kind of like fetishize that. Yeah. And uh, and I think like it, you know, I think I've struggled with that, you know, over the over the years. And I think I think part of some of that was me sort of still trying to push that away, but in actuality, like, I still struggled with it. Does that make any sense? It makes a lot of sense, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's very resonant. Uh, you mentioned sort of hierarchy of masculinity that played out with you guys. How did you sort of um, come to grips with that, or in what ways did that manifest itself? Was it, like, in the outfits? Was it in the makeup? Was it in even, like, your singing voice? Like, uh, with, the, with the guys in the band? I mean, it was... It was you know, like Dell and I, you know, he would just like slather on the makeup and like, be, you know, feathers and all sorts of stuff. And I would do my thing. And, um, but at the same time, like out of that, like it was always like, sort of between all of us is like, which one of us was really more butch. Yeah. Like, you know, and uh, at least in my, in my head and, uh, I don't know. I think over time, it just it it sort of like you know went away. Did you but. ever feel like the less butch you presented yourself, the less sexual you would come off to the audience? Did that have any correlation between the presentation of masculine or feminine and the ability to be sexual and sexually desired by in the crowd? The more feminine I presented myself, the less sexual. Is that the question? Yeah. No, that never really crossed that that never really crossed my mind. I always you know, felt pretty sexual, sort of, no matter what I was um, 
doing, I mean, I wasn't even thinking about this stuff. I just looked at pictures from like, I just saw some pictures from uh, uh, the, the Saturday Night Live that we did. And I'm, I'm wearing like a, like a, you know, a shoulderless women's heatherette, like pants thing. Okay. And I wasn't even, it w I just like, that's just what I wanted to, you know, it w I wasn't even really conscious of necessarily what I was doing. It's sort of like now I go back right. and I look at it, but I wasn't really thinking about it. And a lot of what was written about you, I know Rolling Stone would refer to you as flamboyant, and you would always sort of be written about in the lens of your queerness. Yeah. Were you aware of that at the time? And then did that ever bother you? Or was it exciting because you really were like the first in many senses? Not the very first, but I don't know, you represent this very specific era. And even what you're talking about right now of just doing it because it felt right and not yeah. really. I think today, and I'm I, with a lot of the young queer pop stars, there's a very concerted effort to corner a fandom and to present a certain image. And it sounds like your image was just you being you. And then you look back on it now and you realize all of the ways in which it was sort of a reaction to your childhood, et cetera. Uh, doing. Yeah. It was ramshackle. I mean, we were just, you know. I, I, I have, I'm really like, I have no style. Although I do, when I, when I see something that I want to wear, I know that. But like, we were just, you know, throwing on whatever. And wait, there was a question that you just asked a second ago that I... That um, I this just how much thought went into it in the beginning in terms of, oh, when people were writing about you as a queer artist. Yeah, I mean... There were so many instances when I was researching where they would call you flamboyant Jake Shears. Oh God, it was like, we really had to take one for the team for a long time. like. And I knew it was really frustrating with, with a lot of the media, especially in like 2004, um, you know, it's almost 15 years ago. It was, they could be really, it, it could be very dismissive, um, super rude, you know, about our sexuality, about, it was always kind of like, sort of, the, it, people tried to like paint us into a corner uh, with that. and. It, I would I would get really frustrated. Like I, I think there was a lot of like homophobic stuff that like we had to sort of deal with, you know, in just general press. Like there was really like a lot of like backhanded, um, you know, it was always always and and all you know the 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 gay thing, the queer thing, like you know always seemed to come f first, <laughs> you know, and and you know I felt like the media really tried to box us in, in a way. And I don't, I always knew that that, that was okay because I knew it was gonna make it easier for people down the road, you know? I knew that it was like, it was definitely these little sacrifices that we were making or having to go through certain things and, and being disappointed or whatnot in certain moments. But I knew that, I knew that down the road it was gonna get better for for queer artists and singers, and um, and that was just part of the process of like you know making that road a little bit wider. So now that you're able to look back on that, has that road um, widened? Has it expanded? What do you look at now, the current landscape with this swath of LGBTQ artists? Do you think the media and just the way we handle uh, queerness and the conversations around it have more depth and or nuance? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I, I, you know, you can just look at the landscape and see, I think it's, I think there's, there's a lot of space for, you know, people who act and, and sing and direct and write. I think there's, I think there's a lot, I think the, I think now there's a lot more space for that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's dealt with a lot more sense, you know, it's, it's dealt with a lot more sensitively. Um, but I'm really happy to see so many singers and uh, performers be embraced. And, you know, it doesn't seem like it's not really that big of a deal anymore. And that's a, that's a great thing. Yeah. Uh, one last question about the attitude cover. I yeah. think it might have seemed like a subtle decision, but you're wearing makeup, visible makeup, and you're wearing nail polish, which to queer people is just part of the course of our, you know, how a lot of us like to present ourselves. But for a lot of people out there, putting that image on the masculinity issue is a really bold and exciting statement. It read that way for me. Um, can you talk about that decision to present yourself in that way on that cover? Well, first of all, I. 
I always thought that I looked terrible in makeup. I don't think I looked that good in makeup. But um, I was really happy with how that makeup turned out because I, I, I thought it I thought it looked really cool. Um, I thought it was just interesting to just kind of like go with it. I think I, I think in you know in the in the gay world, I think we've gotten so caught up with representing ourselves in a certain way. I think Instagram's really uh, kind of one of the culprits in this. I feel like we curate ourselves to look a certain way, or I think you know, being masculine is supposed to be sexier, or at least that's what we t tell ourselves, and that's what we keep being told. Um, and I think, I think it's a real, you know, it's 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 a bummer that 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 guys can't just feel like they can be themselves. I think that now it's so easy to like to really cultivate and sculpt an image that's not necess that's not you. Um, and I think that that I think it's so prevalent. And I think that. Um, you know, I think that that f you know f femininity and and just I think gay guys just you know being themselves can really be looked down upon in a certain way by all of us, and and surprisingly from within our own community. That's yeah, no, exactly. It's really um, you know, there's this just this there's a butch worship and that I am absolutely guilty of myself. I am not taking myself out of this. You know, it's exactly what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Just and I th I think it comes from that pain within all of us. I think it comes from growing up. I think it comes from not feeling good enough. And yeah, I think it's I think it's a I think it's an issue and I really wish and I really hope for it to 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 eventually dissipate some. How do you think we can, I, I do too, how do you think we can actively work to dismantle it? I think small acts, like even you wearing makeup on that cover, do just that. But on the larger level, you're hinting at something that is a growing problem within our community. Mm. Instagram's only becoming more ubiquitous and we're only curating harder, right? Yeah. As we start to see these highly, uh, doctored images and also yeah. really the ways in which everyday people now brand themselves. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, it's a large question, I know, but like, what can we do, all queer people, to sort of help push up against that? Turn it off. <laughs> Turn the shit off. You know what I mean? Like, really, like, there's, I don't know what, we, we follow these people, we're constantly looking at these pictures, and, you know, when it's just like, one after the other, like I think it does, you pick up your phone all day and it's just like when all you're seeing is this like perfection, I think it, I don't think it's like good for our brains. I think first of all, the best thing to dismantle it is to, to turn that shit off and try to like get it off your phone. Um, that's all I can, that's or not all I can think of, but I think that that's, yeah, yeah. I think that that's one way, um, you know, to, what, what do you think? I think talking about it is yeah. like the first thing. I think that like it's just a conversation that I think a lot of people don't even have, even like between friends or not necessarily in interview formats, but just the conversation. You know, you mentioned that sort of like, there's a universal feeling that I think a lot of, I can speak on behalf of gay men, I don't want to speak on behalf of all LGBTQ people, but that a shared bond of otherness and ostracization as a child that stays with you. I think you're hinting at something which is like, these pains stay with us and they get triggered in certain ways in adulthood. Mm. And I just think that things like Instagram and the body dysmorphia in mm. our community specifically because of these images and the lack of discourse around it, mm. I think it affects us in like monumental ways that yeah. we'll look back upon in 15 years and be like, fuck, oh that really fucked with us. Yeah. Um, I just think talking about it. I, feel, I know that I feel better when I talk about it because then I don't feel so alone in my thoughts about it. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that's yeah. like yeah, dismantling yeah, yeah, yeah. it, but like. Yeah, I mean, I've struggled with body dysmorphia absolutely for a long time and still do. Um, and I think that, I think that that's, that's, you know, part of it. It's, uh, 
it's so funny. Like I was, I talked about this in, in an attitude interview actually, and like one of the gay blogs, you know, like put up a bunch of shirtless pictures of me, and were like, you know, with my quote. Of, it, it like you know, I was like, oh, you really, you really got me this time, you know. Like, it's it's like it's something that you know that everybody does, and I'm absolutely um, guilty of it myself. But it's something that I I feel like I've really like been, you know, working on. No, but I. <laughs> but one question: I you're very known for being naked on stage, and to hear that your body dysmorphic for some people might be like, wait a minute, he is like has such a great body. Is that ever a weird thing to reconcile? The idea of being naked and on stage a lot, but then also struggling with this um, body dysmorphia? Yeah, I mean, not necessarily. I mean, I never really got naked naked. No. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I gotta tell you that like, I, when I hoof it on stage as hard as I do, and sometimes that shit gets so fucking hot that, uh, I'm sorry, like close the first go. <laughs> I mean, there have been shows, there have been shows where I would have buckets of ice water on the side of the stage and I would be so hot that I would dip towels in ice water and just in between songs and put an ice cold towel like all over me. Um, I just, I can, I can run really hot. But wait, what was the question again? Um, I, uh, oh, oh, body dysmorphia and being naked on stage. But I love these like inside facts about like the stage work. Um, yeah, no, but just like what it's like, I think for a lot of people, it's like they would look at someone like you and would say, I can't believe someone like that would suffer from this. But I think it's something that many people suffer from. That's why, I mean, that's because I, I, I've been so obsessive over just like trying to look, you know, as perfect as I possibly can. Um, you know, thinking that's the like only way I'm gonna get laid or something. Yeah. You know? Um, which is just like not, not true, and I've I've definitely chilled out on that side a bit. I think maybe it's just getting older. I'm pushing forty. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not it's not as big of a deal to me anymore. But I definitely have, um, you know, struggled with it to the point of like making me making me ill, wearing my body down so hard that you know I. I I've been very unhealthy because of that. You know, just pushing myself way too hard. Yeah. Um, a couple last questions before I let you go. Broadway debut, 2018, Kinky Boots, huge. I've been like wanting you to be on Broadway. I mean, it's like crazy to me that you haven't been on Broadway. Uh, you're in rehearsals right now. Yeah, yeah. What is it like gearing up to make your Broadway debut? Uh, yeah. This is the most, uh, I just finished my first week of rehearsals and I'm going back in tomorrow. I open in like two, <laughs> <laughs> two weeks. Uh, I think this is the hardest thing I'll have ever done. I think this is the most challenging. I love putting myself in situations that make me really uncomfortable. Uh, I do it, you know, all the time. I, I don't know why, but I love, I love biting off a little bit more than I can chew. And this is definitely scraping that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a. Uh, it is nuts. It's like, I mean, the, 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 I, I'm on stage for two and a half hours <laughs> and, you know, every little thing is choreographed. Props, picking, I mean, I have my, my tracking, like I asked for basically just a list of my tracking through the whole show and it's like, it's, it's, so are you like nervous or like how, how do you uh, compartmentalize that? That's so overwhelming. At the beginning of rehearsals I was really nervous and then I really just started to be like, fuck it, like whatever. And I've been having, everyone's so nice and fun and I've been going in and we've just been working super hard, really long days. I started shadowing Stark Sands, um, you know, on the side of the stage and basically while the show's going on, running around backstage the entire time, like figuring out where, wh what exit that is and where people are going in and out of. Um, and everything, it's just like a dream. The songs are really hard, you know, I'm getting there. Um, I, I just, I know once, I know once it all clicks, I'm gonna be having so, I'm already having fun, but it's gonna be so much fun, but it's also one of the biggest challenges I've ever, I've ever 
faced, and that's exciting to me. In addition to the new music and the Broadway debut, we also have your memoir coming in 2018. So yeah. you're just like a little busy. Um, <laughs> why the memoir now, and what can we expect from it in terms of what you'll be talking about in the book? I've been I've been writing it for a couple years. It's called Boys Keep Swinging, and I did it for uh, Atria on Simon and Schuster. Um, and it's why now. I guess just because I, f I finished it. I mean, I really didn't know when exactly. I'm sort of letting them put out when they when they think whatever they think is best. So it's coming out February 20th, which is like oh my God. Uh, okay. right around the corner. I hope people like it. I, I, I really worked very hard on it, and it was such a part of my life, um, my daily life, that it was really difficult to let go and they basically had to like rip it out of my hands. And I'm just, I, I sit there and steam about it, just being like, God, why did, why did I leave that whole chapter? Like, you know, I'm very, 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 very critical of it. Uh, but I'm, I'm really proud of it. It's about, most of it is kind of my childhood up until like I'm about 21, only the band comes in the last third of it and it ends in 2006. Mm. So it's, it's just a lot about, you know, New York when I moved here and, um, I think it's really funny, and it's 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 got it's. I'm really proud of it. There's a lot of cameos. There's a lot of New York cameos all over the place. Um, there's a lot of people in it. Cool. And, um, yeah. We'll definitely be looking forward to that. Uh, you've worked with Kylie Minogue a lot. Kylie Minogue super fan. Can you give one fact about Kylie that people don't know just from knowing her so personally over the years? Oh my God. One fact. Yeah. Or ten. She's very she's very comforting. She's a very comforting, warm person. That's I don't I, I don't know about it. I don't know about a fact, but <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, but that's that's you know she's a, she's a grounding person and um, she's a very kind person, and she's what you know she's kind of a um, she's a loner. She's a loner. She's a quite she 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 keeps to herself. You know that's one thing about her. She works. She loves her work. She works super, super hard, and she's she, you know, she keeps to her, she's she lives a very quiet life in a way. The last question I want to ask you before you go: I really look at you as a trailblazer, um, both musically and just as a openly queer person. Who you said this earlier, and this is what always sort of defines my love of you is the humor, and there's just a humor about the Scissor Sisters that's always ran true to me that's made listening to Scissor Sisters an enjoyable act. So it's not just like, oh, I love the music. It's like, I love the feeling of listening to, listening to Scissor Sisters. Like, there's just so many songs, keep your shoes on, like just so many songs I can think of that just put me in a really specific kind of good mood. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't even know like the meaning behind what I'm listening to and then I love it nonetheless. And, and it also, it just feels so queer to me. So my question. Um, do you feel like a trailblazer? Do you feel like someone who's moved the needle in terms of queer culture or just the culture? Do you feel that sense? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm always happy to hear it. I like, I don't know. I don't think, I just don't, I don't, th I don't think of it really that way. I feel very, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm happy that people think that, and um, and I'm proud of what I've done. Um, but ba just back to the humor, really quick. Do you know who, where it comes from? Tell me. Like full on, when we were just starting to write, right before we started writing music, Beck's Midnight Vultures came out, and he's one of my favorite artists of all time. And I really, as far as the influence of how the humor mix in, mixes in with the emotional stuff. And there's serious stuff too, and it all kind of blends together. It's all woven together. It's absolutely him. Hmm. Like he is who I've always looked up to. Um, you know, for that he does it so seamlessly. He can be very funny. He can be really sad. Um, anyways, I just wanted to say that. Yeah. But uh, as far as being a trailblazer, I, I I hope so. I think that's cool if that's the case. Um, 
I'll co-sign. I'll, it's my, I'll put my thing <laughs> But down thank on you it. for that. Of course. Um, well, Jay, thank you so much. This yeah. has been really informative and, and, and a wonderful time for me. Hope you had a thank good time. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. We'll hope we'll be seeing you in 2018 with the book, with the music, with the Broadway debut in Kinky Books. There's a lot of Jake Shears in 2018 to look forward to. So we'll be checking him out. Thank you, guys.